Hi, um, this week we're going to be talking about the 1995 film Safe that was directed by um, film director Todd Haynes. And it follows the story of this woman named Carol, who's played by Julianne Moore, who um, struggles with environmental illness. And it's kind of her story as her illness progresses and she goes from being this kind of perfect suburban housewife to um, living on a commune with a bunch of people who struggle with the same things that she does. And today we're going to be talking about the significance of cinematography within this film and um, images presence and images text within this film. So if anyone would like to start us off, be fantastic. Um, yeah, I can start us off. So like right out the gate, the opening shot is it's on the hood of a car and it follows the street at night. So that not only tells us, um, if you look around the surrounding area, you can tell that it's a suburban um, neighborhood. So our main characters are always gonna be middle class or higher. And as the like scenes progress and we actually see the characters um, in their clothing, it also infers that this movie takes place during the 1970s and follows those kind of patriarchal societal norms. Yeah, and there's also um, following that, isn't there a shot in the film where it's showing um, a bunch of houses being built that are like in the process of being built? So that I think that also just kind of solidifies this kind of theme, I, at least in Carol's character, because her character is pretty flat, there's not much there, but like she's very centered around homemaking and making a home. And that's um, her whole role in her life or um, her whole character's purpose until she does like start to experience the environmental illness that like this movie is kind of centered around. And um, keeping with the whole like, like the suburbia thing. Um, there's one thing I noticed about Carol's whole, like her journey throughout this film and that it's completely and utterly isolating. Like she goes from being in this kind of suburban housewife bubble to being on a commune and she's like completely isolated within that. So I was wondering if anyone else kind of picked up on that or if there's any like cinematography or mise-en-scene that like jumped out to you to represent that. Cause I think that was like a really big part it was just like, the complete and utter isolation of this character. Well, the shots, even though the shots are very wide, like we can see all the surrounding rooms and like foreground and so on and the characters moving behind um, Carol. So like, even though there's so much space, you can really feel how isolated she is. And I'd say they even bring this isolation further by the fact that a lot of her shots, she's dead center within the frame. Mm -hmm. I have some screen caps of some of these shots where Carol um, either is in a room or she enters a room and she's like the smallest thing in the room. Like she's truly not the focal point within the shot. So if I just um, pull that up really quickly. Um, can you guys see this? Yeah. So you have um, this shot where like Carol's like, she's not even the, the main subject of this shot. It's like, it's her home and it's the material things within her home. And usually in, in this film, at least, um, her, her surroundings precede her, which I think was in the Reed article. Like you see her living room before you see her. And I think that just really like solidifies this whole, like not only her, the flatness of her character, but the fact that her character is so centered around this material, purpose of like being a housewife. I think there's another one here where like all the women are the smallest things in, in these rooms. Like they're very kind of, I guess, disconnected. So stop me if you see anything um, worth delving into further. Two slides back. I noticed in a lot of the scenes where she's out with other people, like her friends, there's a like a very, very strong pink color palette. You can see that a lot of other times. And I, th I think what it kind of says is how abrasive the rest of the world is to her because the colors are very bright and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, her costuming was also very like, um, I think representative of like her character because Carol's very, very quiet and she's very kind of like, I keep saying like stereotypical housewife, like she like, she's very demure, is that, is that a word? that I can use in this context, but she's, um, and her clothing re really represents that she's always in pastels and knit, and she's always like very nice and very proper housewife. Like in this scene, um, you can see her in a pastel pink dress with her nice little short perm. Um, and that's also just like the isolation of her character. I have a few stills here um, that I really wanna talk about with you guys about um, experience on. oh sorry yeah i just wanted to add something on real quick about like her clothing i don't know if anybody else noticed this but like as her like mental stability like crumbles and decreases so does her outfits they go from being um very proper to more casual yeah definitely and i think that's something that we can see in this scene um here where she this is at least the first time where it struck me that her makeup and everything, like she just looked completely and utterly just like run down as she was like sitting in this hospital bed. This, I feel like this point in the film was kind of her, her turning point. And I know that Brady mentioned the pink, which you notice a lot in these scenes when she's speaking to a doctor who's usually a male, which I wanted to get you guys' thoughts on. Uh, yeah, I... Do you have a do you have a shot of the the therapist office? I don't think I do, but I do have um, this doctor's office that um, is also just like completely pink. Well, I noticed in the, the psychiatrist's office that as you were talking about the the shot makes it seem like she's very small and her surroundings are very big. And I think that kind of reinforces the doctor being a male because the therapist's office doesn't look like a safe space. It just looks like she's put on the spot. And yeah. No, definitely. Like, I don't know if you guys um, like notice this or I'm like reading into, I don't know, but um, she only has male doctors and it seems as if they do not take her seriously, which is like just so representative of like not only Carol's role as like a woman with a, a woman within the society but just like how women are treated as being hysterical rather than take being taken seriously which I think that the pink color palettes in these medical settings and like her smallness like Brady said in the therapist's office or even in these um this shot here and this one here where she's surrounded by pink and it seems as if um it's kind of like the pink is looking down on her as a woman and it's kind of showing that she's like it's kind of representative of this femininity that causes her to not be taken seriously yeah with this scene in particular um her husband and the doctor straight up through their lines you can tell that they're not taking her seriously but with the therapist office we don't even have to hear his response to what she says the way he's sitting um he's like leaning back with his like one leg crossed over the other he looks totally disengaged like he doesn't care about anything she has to say and with Julianne Moore um her voice is very like meek and like even when she's angry and her character's angry you just can't take it that seriously because there's no like drive behind it it's very like something you can brush off because her demeanor so small yeah I, I that's a really good point and also like she's small in her voice and she's small in her stature in most of these scenes that we meant like how we mentioned earlier how she's like just truly like consumed um by her surroundings is there anything that um anybody wanted to say about this particular shot or any of the shots beforehand or can i stop screen sharing this um I was going to say about this shot, um, just to add on to what you guys were saying, was um, like how different the shot would be and its effects if it was a close up of, um, you know, if you can imagine that this shot was only of um, Carol in the bed, you would only see like a pink background. And like, I feel like the wide shot um, 
it's just you know like it, the pink is an expression of the femininity but because you know there's a there's a difference in if the shot was wide versus close up and um in terms of other scenes um i wanted to look at the scene where right after she's exposed to the chemicals on the highway um and she, i can find the timestamp for it but where she's kind of spiraling in the parking lot Yeah, I think that um, definitely what you said about the wide shot and as um, as you were talking and as we were staring at this still, um, it's very evident that in this scene, and I keep jumping back and forth, I'm sorry, but um, in, oh, sorry, oh my God. In this scene, the men are physically above her. Like she's either on a bed or she's sitting down and they're standing above her. And then in the scene that Brady and Laurel are talking about in the, psychiatrist office which I'm like so sad I don't have a still of right now but she's sitting down and he even though he's he's behind this big desk and it looks as if he's looking down upon her um like as a as a hysterical as a hysterical woman so I wanted to add the um the color palette not only like reflects her position within society and her home but it's also very telling of the era they're in so they did a great job of incorporating both those things. I'm gonna stop. Sure. There we go. Definitely, I think uh, that whole like Pepto Bismol pink is just so 70s, 70s, 80s, just Pepto Bismol crazy patterns that are gross. <laughs> like scenic realism at its finest. Sorry, Brady, you were gonna say something. Uh, something I noticed about that scene in the doctor's office. Um, and then like five minutes later, she says, after he questions her like illness, she says, I don't, I don't, I don't do drugs, I don't drink, I don't even like coffee. And five minutes later, she's holding a pot of coffee. And I think what that says about her is that she's having to lie to the doctors in order to get them to take her seriously. Yeah, um, I don't remember that is that the scene where she's like is after dinner and she's like pouring coffee for her husband has it pulled up oh awesome uh, uh is it sharing the picture is it sharing the folder it's sharing like the, the picture is not the the whole screen um, I do have the scene where she has the the coffee pot for her like if you want me to uh, share yeah. that you can totally do that um right there yeah and it's almost it's like there's a wall in between uh what's, I forget his name but there's a wall between her and her family which right. kind of shows that she's hiding it from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we talked about this last year in Noir, this kind of idea of that human and has of celluloid mise-en-scene, which is basically looking at a frame as if it's um, two separate cells. So there was one scene where it was like, the, the morally depraved character has the dark half of the screen and then the good character has the light half of the screen. And I think we're seeing that here with this kind of divide, like it's as if they're in two different sh shots, they exist within two different um, spaces and that just further disconnects her from and isolates her. Not only in this shot, but like the rest of the film, she's just so utterly isolated. Um, but as, as a man, her husband doesn't really take her seriously. You don't really see as much genuine sympathy from him as you would expect from a husband. And Carol's in her, her classic bubblegum pink. And um, just um, all these little elements, I feel like really do add up to this whole like patriarchal um, gaze upon Carol and how she's not taken seriously. And she's very looked down upon for her femininity or for just being a woman trying to be taken seriously within the medical field or the social world. Yeah, with that whole, especially like in like the 50s to the 70s before there was really like a feminism like movement, she's very 
everything, most of her personality kind of revolves either around her personal sickness or her husband, but she does so much for her husband and he doesn't. The first time she really makes a complaint about something, being herself concerned about her health, he doesn't want to listen or believe her. Um, there's the scene where she's in the bed writing the note and there's an narration before it and he comes in and like yells at her and she just breaks down um, about the fact that he doesn't believe her but she's also apologizing at the same time and we can see this connection uh, between the both of them like straight from the beginning of the movie um, when they get out of the car and it just cuts to like a sex scene he's she's just like silent and embracing him and you can tell that she's not really engaged and she really only cares about his pleasure with him not yeah it's like she only not that like she only exists to serve him but like it's this like you this emotional discon disconnect between husband and wife that's like really unnerving and unsettling to see especially when she's going through like such a visible and such a dramatic um bout of illness as um carol does in this in this film did did you guys expect, um, did you guys expect, uh, like, Carol's relationship with her husband to stay consistent through the film? Because especially off of that scene that you guys were just talking about where I even felt that, like, he was more frustrated about his own, how he felt, like, he didn't really care about how she felt. And I saw that as a setup for, like, that relationship to end. But for them staying together could also sort of be um, a commentary at the same time. Um, so what do you guys think? Um, like definitely she, I don't think I expected their relationship to change throughout the film just based on Carol's character. And in the read article, it's just so much emphasis on her just being flat and like this dynamic, like this growth, I didn't really expect to see happen between her and Greg. Um, and I think that like their relationship is just this further isolating um, element. I keep saying the word isolation, take a shot every time I do, but um, this kind of isolating element in Carol's life as suburban housewife, dressed pretty in pink. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to add on, this is like kind of besides the point, um, but like the image is text. Every time she like feels uneasy and starts to feel sick, she's usually like within the center of the frame and it kind of pans in on her. And the music usually matches that and it also makes the audience feel uncomfortable. Cause I believe it was the read article that was like, we never get an answer for what is causing her illness, which not only confuses the characters within her world but also the audience watching but we also those watching feel uncomfortable because there's no answer but there's obviously something wrong i don't know if anybody else had any ideas connected to that i think with the relationship between her and greg i noticed that a switch flipped when he noticed her nose bleeding in the bedroom. And I, I think that just kind of represents how their trust is based upon like direct vision. There's no, like they can't her, she can't have her own life outside of Greg and it, Greg doesn't appreciate that she's sick until he directly sees it. Yeah, it's like he needs physical proof. Like he can't just take his wife's word for it. Like she's in, like untrustworthy or like unreliable for her own experiences, which I think a lot of women um, have gone through. And not only like the time period that this is set in, where obviously women were more, were in a lower social standing, but like in contemporary society where women are just kind of not taken seriously in these, in these aspects. So I think that was like really a good point. Um. Would you say that we are somewhat, the viewer, somewhat put in a place similar to her husband's with the fact that we're also disconnected from what's going on with her? All the shots are far away. Um, it's never really like clearly up close. There's the one shot um, 
when she goes to Renwood and the lady showing her around and they walk past this like outside cabin and it's like three layers. The camera is on the opposite wall. Then we can see the people within the building and then there's the other wall and through the those windows we can see her and the woman walking past. So it's like we can observe and we can try to understand but we don't get to much like her husband. I think you're making an interesting point because I was just thinking about um, the term, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but um, very similitude and like that was a lot in the reading and it's and it was more um it became more of a part of like film and cin cinematography um recently and so i was thinking about that in this film like i'm looking at um i'm looking at the scene where she gets exposed to the chemicals and i can add it but i can pull it up but um you know, the way that the camera starts shaking and it actually kind of brings you into that experience, but you're also making a good point and that could raise the question of like, is there certain times in this film where the, the cinematography is used so you can feel what Carol's feeling and other times it has the opposite effect, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think like both of you just made like a really interesting point about, um, not like I think we've like touched upon Carol's um, disconnect and isolation from all the other characters within the film, but like the audience's disconnect. And there's, I actually wrote down this read quote from the article that says, um, in, in the film, common sense and expertise do not neatly fold in with each other, but they remain in a strained and an antagonistic relationship. So it's like, what you think you know about medicine and then Carol's experiences. And it's just really hard, not only for like medical professionals or her husband to kind of empathize and try and understand her, but it's also hard for us because there's kind of, I don't want to say no rhyme or reason to what she's going through, but it seems, um, I don't know, it's kind of like disorienting, trying to, trying to figure it out. Like they say environmental illness, but what does that, what does that really mean? Right? Yeah, I think that this is also kind of, um, capturing a, um, a time in science development where um, clearly like you know it's not like today where we know the effects of you know carcinogens and blah 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 all that stuff it's like I feel like this was shot in a time where it was new and when I first saw the clips about these like advertisements on tv for like the environmental stuff like it felt so like culty to me like it literally like they seemed like they were like redwood like it seemed like a cult advertisement and like I don't know if that's social commentary but I just think that like this movie is kind of like it's definitely taking place in in a time where this was a new field and so there probably were some kind of culty groups about it honestly and um, so yeah, you know, I think it, it seems creepy, it seems mysterious, but as you go through the film, you're just like, oh, this is just like a part of history, this is just how it used to be. Um, environmental illness was just the name for hundreds of illnesses and allergies, you know. Yeah, um, with that, the whole Renwood and like a culty feeling, it definitely gives like a group thought kind of thing. Um, there's the one scene where we see the man who's like completely covered uh, walking and the man that, and the guy that runs Runwood is like uh, whatever his name was is afraid of everything he's let his anxiety and his illness the anxiety of illness uh, like completely overtake him and then later on we see the dome of which uh, the last shot is in Carol moves into so she starts to become better at Renwood, but she ends up going to the um, the dome and her husband and son are there and help move her in, but it's just, that's completely closed off from the world. And she was already closed off within her own suburban life. Um, she had the other housewives that she was connected to, but there was still a disconnect with her husband and her completely separate from each other but now she's just completely isolated alone with herself yeah um, yeah I think 
go ahead um yeah that that final scene where carol like makes the decision to move into this like porcelain igloo of you know st sterility she like it was really off-putting because it seems as if in that final scene you know she stares into the camera and it's a zoom in on her face as a close-up and she says i love you i really love you and it's kind of like she um I keep using words like connect and disconnect. It's like she's the most connected that she's ever felt to herself while she's the most disconnected that she's ever been from the rest of society. It's like this weird dichotomy between her, like in, in her mind, this like, it feels like psychological torture for this poor woman where like the only solution is to close herself off from everyone and everything. Yet she has this moment of like, I love you. Like, I don't know. I really don't know what to make of that, to be honest. Wait, yeah. what's she saying I love you too? Herself. We oh. this shot is of the mirror's point of view. Yeah. As if we were her reflection in a sense. Did it seem like I don't remember the scene, but did it seem like she was mentally it's the closing shot? But did she seem like she was like in her right mind? Honestly, no, I can pull it up right now. I have the timestamp and um, it was actually, um, I, I wrote down notes that like Zooms played um, a pretty decent part in this film and creating kind of this, this unease within the audience. So um, I can pull up that scene where she's staring into the mirror right now and we can um, take a quick look at it if you guys want to. So can everyone see this? Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. I don't know if there will be sound, so I'll put closed captions on. And then we get this kind of um, very disturbing, I, I would say, close up on her face, which as, as I'm looking at it, I think she looks the worst that she's ever looked. And she's staring directly into a mirror. She has this like sore that's been developing on her forehead the entire film. That's just, and um, you have this kind of um, chioscuro effect with like painting with light and how the one half of her face is um, seemingly completely obscured by by darkness and she's backlit so she, it's like this kind of it's it's a really unsettling composition of effects that we have um, going on here yeah i think, I think that answers that question um her eyes look really beady too and just like just scary you can't really see the whites in her eyes and so i don't know i like like you got, like it was said, like, I think we agree this isn't the, our favorite movie, but like, I think that there's a really a lot of um, cinematography at play that can be discussed. And was that last shot, you don't have to pull it up again, but did that shot fade to black? Um, I'm pretty sure it did, yeah. Okay, I, we read about that and you know, there wasn't really anything with any like, signified meanings of it but that's something that like that's like another cinematography well they say the the eyes of the wind to the soul so usually with characters and shots that are up close you can really see their emotions what's going in their head going in their head and where they're at with that shot it's we can see her but we can't her silhouette there's light around it but her face is half covered in dark and her eyes we really can't see any color of them we can't see the light of her eyes it's really just a small reflection within uh, the center of them it also relates back to what we were talking about earlier about the, the color palettes especially the doctor's scene actually is that's full of the the aquamarine the, the pinks 
and now she's wearing just white and also just a white background and that's it like all personality has been drained from her life yeah it's like she's been completely um wasted away to this point of like nothingness yet the whole i love you line like to like it's she said that really apathetically like there, there was kind of no emotion behind behind any of any of those words but i think that was like the first time that she gave an indication of being satisfied with herself like she's always kind of trying to um change her appearance or like be be good enough like she does the perm and she's like to her husband do you like it and she's very put together but then you have this point where she's completely a skeleton of herself in every sense of the word yet she says this kind of juxtaposing line that is supposed to like signify being at your fullest fullest point right yeah and she kind of lives like like in the like just typical like american dream suburb um setting and so like just coming back to like the question on the prompts, you know, that being the closing line, um, I don't know, I think like that could be some kind of commentary on like, you know, maybe she was someone with um, just kind of like a like, I, you know, honestly, I don't want to comment on her mindset because objectively she was actually pretty kind of just a flat character all around. Um, but, you know, I don't know if loving herself and loving her life was something that she had as a goal I don't know if she had ever thought about it um because you know her making that comment could be like just a commentary on like well I'm an absolute like shell of myself but I can bring myself to say these words um you know but she couldn't do that when she was in her American dream lifestyle you know what I mean yeah definitely. Um, during her time at Renwood I feel like the scene the different scenes that we see there, it gives the illusion of like, maybe she's getting better, that she's finding a place in society that doesn't really revolve around her husband and being a housewife. But um, I made a note of it. Like she has more of a voice and an opinion at Renwood, but she's still lying under the power of a man because the owner of the program is a man. Um, and there's the scene, I forget what, just reading mentioned it but the one with her birthday and they're like speech and she has nothing to really say and she needs the permission of the guy that runs it to say something much like she felt she needed the validation of her husband and he basically finishes um and speaks for her which was very like normal for the t that time like the wife or whatever didn't really have a chance to have an opinion or say things for themselves and I just thought that that was like an interesting reflection of even though she's away from her suburban life, she's still a reflection of those characteristics. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think everybody and everything is honestly uh, in, in one way. I mean, did you guys feel like otherwise Renwood was detached from misogyny? Um, detached from misogyny? Definitely, I don't think so. I think Peter um used this kind of um faux utopia to gather these people who were in their most vulnerable state who had like were just looking for answers and kind of gave them a place where he made them feel as if he could give them answers when obviously there's not much going on medically for these people like carol is physically getting worse and worse yet she has this illusion that she's improving because she's given this false sense of control because they're telling her like you know eat the organic food and um, breathe the fresh air um but there's this one scene in which they're in like a circle and they're sharing their experiences and peter blames them for their illness and he says like you brought this upon yourself and that kind of theme of these female characters being blamed by the male characters who they're subordinate to for their plights is just like so um, reflexive of like not only contemporary US society, but like society decades past for, for women who are not only in the medical field trying to be taken seriously and be empathized with, but like in just modern everyday settings and conversations kind of being um, 
kind of their experiences being minimized? Um, I don't know if anyone remembers, it's when she went to like the first meeting with her husband, it was like a conference thing about environmental illness. And there's a shot after where like all these women together are talking about it. She's even removed within that setting from the people that she should be able to fit in with and actually have more of a voice and opinion with. They're all at this picnic table and she's sitting away from them on like the brick bench and we get like a far away shot so we can see all their figures but it's maybe it's just because she's a flat character in some senses but I feel like there's a lot to really infer about who she is even without them having to tell us based on her blocking clothing and actions. I don't know if anybody else saw anything to read in there um, throughout the film based on those things. I, that just reminded me of um, when they were at the baby shower and like she was like with the little girl. That was a very interesting scene because um, that girl looked like maybe like four years old and like first like seems like maybe, maybe the little girl is like oh you know it like not getting attention it's a baby shower for another kid and so like that little girl's kind of isolated as well with carol and she find it, she kind of feels safe with um carol they're blocked off away from the main party and then when carol has that like breathing attack it's very interesting to watch that um the dynamic change between the child and carol Yeah, I think not only in that baby shower scene, but um, I think we keep circling back to this theme of, of Carol's isolation. And um, I think Laurel mentioned earlier about how it feels as if we're looking in on her and we're unable to truly connect with her, not only because of the flatness of her, but um, I think you mentioned something about just like the mise-en-scene and how like um, her settings precede her, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I just looked at my notes and I noticed that um, in the in the film there's multiple shots where we're literally looking through a door frame and it feels as if um, we're looking in on something we're kind of not supposed to be. I think back to that doctor's office scene, we're not in the room with them. We're seeing through the doorway. Of course, the camera eventually is in the room and we see this different perspective, but it starts out, we're literally like on the outside and it feels as if the film is intentionally trying to um have us be disconnected from carol and um the scene where she's pouring the coffee we're looking through door frames and we're looking through and we're kind of getting the bigger picture is obscured by these structures and these these doorways and things like that which i could be just being looking too into things and being pretentious but like it's like the materialistic nature of her life and like this focus on out the outside and outside appearances is is isolating us even um, from the bigger picture because it's literally being cut off by these by these doorways and things. So I was wondering if anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was I was gonna say like that's a good point of like how that kind of um, positioning like brings a disconnect from Carol, but also I feel like more personally the sense that I got from the film was like I like I got like in in the ways that the door frames were too it's more just kind of like dissociating feeling and it's just it kind of just felt more like 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 for example like looking in on the doctor's office you know we're not really focused on Carol it's kind of just like a world and Carol's living in it and um it like in one sense it could be disconnecting the viewer from Carol but in another sense it could just be connecting the viewer to Carol's sense of like just being one in seven billion people and just like how you know despite all the like frills of society like she still feels out of place you know um two quick things like referring to images text and Carol's mental descent um Within the first like opening shots, we get the above sh shot of these yellow flowers and she's trimming them, uh, which later on will. And at the beginning of the film, we don't see any signs of her um, environmental illness effect. 
Um, but as it gets worse um, and she was standing by the pool, we see those flowers again like wilted. And a shot and sequence that we could really dive into, the one where she gets, where she asks um, one of the health workers for a glass of milk. When she stumbles over to the um, like bureau type place, we see her kind of fall a bit. And that was like the beginning of seeing that she wasn't mentally doing well. It's a very small thing, um, but if you cut onto it, you're like, something about that is off. And then that was followed by her sitting down and she sent her shot. And we see everybody in the house moving around her. And there's like a kitchen island that um, the lady that works for her passes her the milk cup through. And as she takes it and sits in the chair, we, it like slowly zooms in. She's very central shot. And we can see her have a panic attack. We don't have to be told that she's um, not doing well. Um, I don't know if anybody else had anything to add within that scene. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I have the shot pulled up if you want to, because I also thought that that was just like a really impactful, like for lack of a better word, shot. So if you guys want to like take a quick look at um, like 30 seconds of it, I think we could really kind of dive into what, what this film is doing with um, cinematography in this particular scene. I'd go as far to say that this particular scene is really the beginning of her not mentally doing well. Yeah, for sure. Affected by the environmental illness. Yeah, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Creepy. <laughs> um, that use of a dolly zoom, I think, was like one of the best instances of um, cinematography within the film, besides the color palette, which I think was just very noteworthy. But um, the dolly zoom where Carol is is center frame and she she's still, she's isolated again, take a shot. Um, and everything around her is is moving in this really disorienting way that makes the viewer unsettled like I don't know about everyone else but like you kind of can't place what's going on but you know something's very wrong within the shot. I notice that it looks like not even just a zoom but like the world around her is kind of spiral spiraling mm -hmm. like the lens is shifting and that kind of gives it a really off-putting vibe. Yeah it's like um, like Laurel said, this is kind of her, her, her turning point and like the people around her going about their business and her environment seems to be overtaking her, which, um, of course we, we now know that environmental illness is her main struggle and conflict within this film, but it seems as if everything around her is totally out of her control and she's kind of stuck within it and she's in this place of like, um, I don't want to say disconnect again, <laughs> but she's in this place of like, um, like you don't, you don't, you truly do not, you can't place what's going on and you can't place what's wrong. And it's this deep inner confusion and disorientation that you see within Carol and then the cinematography gives the audience. I don't know if anyone else picked up on the sound, but the sound was truly also overwhelming within it. Is that something like ambient, whatever? But it was just like, like I didn't like I was in the I was in the auditorium and I was like I don't want to be listening to this right now because it feels like it's like consuming my viewing experience, which is the whole point. But still, it's like she's very much in her own head, and those sounds and stretching of the camera puts us in our own heads, um, and yeah. off put by her experience. It's um. I don't want to get the word wrong. It's um, image is presence for sure because you get this like emotional response to this like uneasy um, frame that they 
put together, but it's this kind of um, psychological image. I think that's, I think I'm using the correct terminology here, but you get this, just like this general emotional atmosphere that you can't quite place, but like you know that something is really off. Um, which like big fan of the Dolly Zoom. <laughs> Good job. Um, but there was another thing about this film, I'm trying to jog my memory. Um, oh, about this scene where the milk, um, a grown woman loves chugging large glasses of milk. I don't know if you guys have seen Inglorious Bastards, but in the opening shot um, of that film, you have a Nazi sh uh, soldier who's, um, who's like on a dairy farm and he's this, he's supposed to be this like really intimidating character, but he asks for a glass of milk instead of a glass of wine. And it's so completely off-putting. And I feel like that's what we're getting in this film with Carol just sitting there chugging a glass of milk as the world around her crumbles. And um, I was just wondering if anyone else had. Well, I mean, like in, it's still pushed today, but like, the American government really pushes the idea that you need milk in order to function like at any age that it's like a huge health benefit when really it's not it's like a form of propaganda it is for lower class who can't afford to get nutrients from other things but for the most part you're not supposed to consume dairy past a certain age because their body isn't made for but our government pushes it and it was heavily heavily pushed from probably late 40s to the 80s. I mean, like still today, but it was more heavily prominent then. Yeah, you both make good points, but I definitely like agree that it was kind of like, I laughed when you said that about her chugging milk. Cause that's like really true. It was just like kind of just like uncanny a little bit. And just like a lot, I feel like this whole film is so uncanny and um, just the way that things were put together that created contradictive feelings, almost like in every scene. And, but yeah, like, um, yeah, you're not wrong. I think it was, I think like just, and I, I don't know what did she, I don't know what she said, but she was like, I think she said like I only drink milk or like something. Yeah, she's like I'm a milkaholic. Like yeah, she said I'm a milkaholic. Like what? Yeah, that was like kind of weird. Also, I, well, I like, like the film. Um, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say the film centers around um, the idea, like the American mm -hmm. uh, suburban housewife, housewife, et cetera, et cetera, which is like I said the government used to like in the 50s there were lots of ads about like the perfect housewife and it was definitely downplayed in the 70s not as bad as it was then um but like kind of what was it the um one of the readings talked about like secondhand smoke commercials um i was surprised we didn't get any kind of like commercials for um within the film for like milk drinking because that would have been something that was shown then we did however get the shot of the like animal planet like documentary yeah on the yeah yeah um yeah it definitely it puts you in the era you feel like you're in this setting the whole milk thing <laughs> um yeah it definitely would have been like I think like a nod towards like what you're saying about like the American government pushing it like I think we can all remember in like a elementary school cafeteria with like the poster of like some celebrity with a milk mustache and the words got milk on it like I think that's like a core memory for all Gen Z kids but um correct me if I'm wrong I think that isn't milk usually used in cinema and in film as this kind of symbol of innocence like it's it's unsettling to see Inglorious Bastards a Nazi soldier drink a pint of milk or Carol this grown woman chug a pint of milk but a child it's not Right, so I feel like this kind of, this character trait that this flat character has, and then the one thing that she proclaims is I'm a housewife and a milkaholic, is just further kind of infantilizing her and further kind of diminishing her, her experiences. And it's kind of like people look down on her and then she's like this little girl chugging a glass of, a glass of milk. <laughs> it's interesting you say that, because I was also thinking she never she doesn't get the milk herself 
herself. She has someone else go to the fridge and get it for her, like she's a little kid. Yeah, she's she's very much treated. I don't want to say not as a grown woman, but like, I think we've touched on this plenty, like not taken seriously. And then um, who knew a glass of milk would have so much to say about the symbolism in a film. Um, I think, but that also like that goes back to the scene with her being blocked off with the little girl like there might, might be a lot of things um that are actually pointing to this symbol so I think those two are good um examples I'm glad we got this far in the in an analysis of that yeah um there was one other thing that like I remember being like I want to talk about this so bad but I can't quite place it right now. Um, definitely that scene that we watched um, with the Dolly Zoom, images, presence, unsettling, emotional ick, I think. Um, and then the prompt itself says the words, how does this, how does this cinematography um, like contribute to the narrative and then contemporary US society? And totally not being political, oh my God. But the way in which the media is used and the way in which this kind of isolation and like illness is used, like it feels very pandemic. Like, I don't know if it's just because our lives have been inundated with, you know, pan pandy propaganda, but it's like um, the media, instead of the scenes where she's watching these commercials and like the commercial for the commune or like Peter's help retreat whatever it's claims to be um you don't get this like mise on a beam where you have um the screen within the screen the character watching a screen the whole screen is the tv like the media truly does encompass the entire and the entirety of it and it like um which i thought was just like an interesting choice for lack of better word and then her final scene where she chooses ultimately to be in this barren white porcelain just kind of lacking environment for for her health which obviously is not improving I don't know I think it's very quote-unquote contemporary U.S. society yeah with regards to COVID um you know like like the connection that I make is like I've been like studying disasters and how COVID is could be a disaster for, and that's a whole other conversation, but, you know, disasters um, really exemplify social imbalances. And um, we see that, we've seen that a lot with the pandemic um, as the communities that have suffered the most. And so it's interesting that you compare this to COVID because, um, you know, the whole environmental illness thing could have, it, sorry, um, while not a disaster, it's, it has similar effects, you know, just the way that we see um, environment, um, how would I say, it? how we see systemic issues reflected in environmental science and um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think um, like the whole contemporary U.S. society and like this whole thing where like our contemporary U.S. society has been just completely consumed by this whole public health threat and then you see carol's world consumed by this health threat even although she is alone in it whereas in this pandemic is such a harsh word in this pandy we all have each other whereas in this film carol has herself and her fellow cult members on the commune right um and then we also of course have um this whole theme of female um disempowerment, is that a word? Of patriarchal male gaze, oppressing women and claiming their hysteria is the reason, the root of their problems, right? Um, I think that I personally don't have any more points to, to add. I think we like really tore apart this film for all it's worth. But if anyone else has some stuff before we wrap up, um, all right. Awesome. No, I just think it was shot really well. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Like, it wasn't my favorite narrative. Oh, goodbye. It wasn't my favorite. Like, it, I wouldn't choose to watch it, but I get. I, I'm glad I did because it obviously had a lot to say. 
So like the far away shots can be disconnecting, but it's almost satisfactory to be able to see everything at the same time. Yeah, definitely. All right. Awesome. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Bye.